The views and opinions expressed in this podcast do not necessarily reflect those of any major corporation whatsoever. Well then, the great Gats Bunny. <sighs> Excuse me. <laughs> Let's talk about books. You see, people always say, hey, you get off of my cloud. Yes. Because I have moves like Jagger. What a ridiculous freaking song that is. Okay, that's like, the song? Oh, yeah, you've never heard moves like Jagger? I've got the moves like Jagger. I've got the moves like Jagger. It's a ridiculous song. Like, who wants to have the moves of a skeletal 69-year-old pansexual British great-grandfather? See, I am, I am like, so remu- removed from music. And for so long now... I will hear a song that I only know from Weird Al Yankovic. Nice. And I will be surprised that it's an actual song. Yeah. And Very then nice. I, and I don't know why. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, this song was a while ago, too. This song was like six or seven years ago. Anyway, I fucking... They really it. made a song called Royals? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Holy shit! Kids love that. My kids love that too. Kids love that freaking song. <laughs> People also say, "Hey, write what you know." And what I know is that I have been a loyal employee in usually good standings for over sixteen years. Yes, for almost almost 17 years so if my work history were a person then i would be getting my first hickey driver's license and pregnancy scare and probably in that order too which is weird yeah so nice and as such i really do have my fingers on the pulse of the book world and i am here to thrust my dirty yet knowledgeable fingers in your ear holes Figuratively, of course, not literally. I'm not literally shoving my fingers in your ear holes. It's a figure of speech. With this week's intellectually idiotic installment of Notes from the Bookstore. And you may find yourself living in a shotgun shack. Yes. And you may ask yourself, wait. What the hell even is a shotgun shack? <laughs> is it is it a shack full of shotguns? Or it, it actually sounds like a shack made of shotguns. Either way, I'm on some FBI watch list. <laughs> because either way, we're dealing with way too many shotguns. Mm-hmm. In this shack. Yes. A shotgun shack is basically the opposite of a love shack. Yes, it is. When you really think about it. Be about as far away from a love shack as you can get. Yeah. As your Plymouth Chrysler will take you. Yeah, yeah. It seats about 20. Yeah. So hurry up and bring your jukebox money. (laughs) Sometimes it feels really good if you're being depressed to imagine anything being said to be said in a B-52's voice. Like the guy from B-52's. Yeah. Like, I would love to hire him to read the Bible. (laughs) Yes. Like, I'm not one for audiobooks of the Bible, but I would buy that one. You know? I would buy the the audiobook of the Bible, read by such luminaries as Emo Phillips, Bobcat Goldquait, and the guy from B-52s. His In the voice! Beginning, God created the heavens and earth! Yeah. His yeah. voice is very much in, in the line 
of a Gilbert Gottfried, but not as annoying. Yeah. You know, it's one of those very strange, distinctive, only he has that voice. Yeah. He doesn't sound like anybody. He doesn't speak like anybody. It's just him, like Christopher Walken. It, that's just yeah. him. Yeah. You know? And also, and also Emo Phillips. He would, uh, comedian Emo Phillips yes. would also be perfect for reading the Bible. Yes. And then the angel opened the third seal. <laughs> you know? I would buy that. Oh, and also Stephen Wright. Stephen Wright. Blessed be the meek, for they are they will inherit the kingdom of heaven. You know? I would be I would hear that as well. So this week, let us continue with our essentially true origin story. Basically, it's the story of Mr. Steve. It's the Mr. Steve story. Yeah. When last we left our hero, Steve, he was 21 years old and he had just been hired on, under only slightly false pretenses at his local bookstore, which was by Metro Center Mall in Phoenix, Arizona. This was back when Metro Center Mall still meant something. Yes. By the way, now it's being torn down to make office buildings and expensive yuppie apartments and other things white people like. So I don't know, churro stands. Yeah. But um, that darn bookstore is still there. It's still there because as much as people just love to predict the demise of freaking bookstores, the printed word is essentially a cockroach. Yes. Good luck killing words. <laughs> freaking SOBs. So we are still in the year 2000. The and you know, 2000. you know, a lot happened in the year 2000. A lot happened in the year 2000. Last week, we talked a lot about some of the things that happened in the year 2000. So you know what? Uh, let's keep talking about the year 2000. Yeah. The year 2000 was an election year. Okay. So we had two candidates, Al Gore and George Bush II, the sequel. <laughs> okay, yes. So Al Gore ran on a platform focused on saving the planet from global warming, while George Bush II, the sequel, ran on a promise. He ran on a promise to the American people that he would never allow planes to fly into skyscrapers. Yes. Well, that went well. <laughs> wah, wah, wah. I love how he got away with 9-11. I'm not saying that George Bush to the sequel did 9-11, right. but somehow George Bush... You know, it happened under his watch. Right. And yet he wasn't to blame for it. Somehow. Yeah. Somehow. I have. But the thing is, is that if it was any other president, if Hillary were president and 9-11 happened while she was president, people wouldn't be saying, wow, Hillary's such a hero for being so brave in the face of such a crisis. No, yeah. they would be straight up blaming her for the freaking crisis. Mm -hmm. You put any other like Democratic president in charge of America when 9-11 happened and they would basically be crucified. So how did George Bush become stronger after 9-11? Yeah. It makes no well, sense. Starting a how war helps. Away with it? Yes, that is a good point. That is a good point. You know, uh, I, I, it's a good and valid question. Yeah, I never it's, understood that. Like all I can say. George Bush, he's such a leader. If he's such a leader, then how did 9-11 happen? Yeah. He knew that things could happen. He knew that things might happen. He was aware of this. Mm -hmm. How are we not upset at him for not stopping it? I'm so confused. How did he get away with that? I I, I I never understood it. I never understood it. 
Incredible. In the year 2000, the top song on the radio was Breathe by Faith Hill and her cousin, Atheist Mountain. (laughs) Atheist Mountain, cousin of Faith Hill. They're related. In the year 2000, I'm really proud of that. In the year 2000, the World Series was between the New York Mets and the New York Yankees, electrifying the state of New York and boring all of the other remaining states. A a subway series. Yes, a subway series. Yeah. Incredible. Yeah. Oh, so excited. Finally, the focus is on New York. Yes. Because that never happens. As it should be. Yeah. Yeah. As it should be. I, I, I have been working on a hypothesis. Yes. Uh, I'm trying to get some grant money <clears throat> where I am attempting to prove that America started going to shit when Johnny Carson left New York and went to California. That's a good theory. That yeah. is a really good theory. That's yeah. really when the country started going to complete shit. Yeah. This he, he, I might get upset. I might get really upset with this next one. And if I do get upset, if I explode, I apologize. Okay. In the year 2000, a lot of important things happened. Laws were passed, crimes occurred, and important people died, and no one cared because of a stupid little Cuban brat. <laughs> named Elion freaking Gonzalez. <laughs> Elion Gonzalez. One freaking Cuban kid doesn't want to go back to Cuba and he just takes over all of the news. Yeah. For like eight months. Mm-hmm. God. Somehow I managed to miss everything except that picture. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. In the also in the year two thousand, there's a story. There's a story that has to do with alcohol and fish. I'm pretty sure I've never said this story before on the podcast. But if I have told this story before on the podcast, just stick with it because I've got a new angle. Okay. So wild, wild turkey. Yes. What is that? A whiskey? A bourbon? A bourbon uh, what I'm is it? Sure. Bourbon, okay. I don't, I, I don't do hard like, alcohol. Like you, you, you know, like it's the shelf right. down from the Jack Daniels. Okay. You know, okay. it's still a very respectable drink. You gotcha. know, it's it's not yeah. the moonshine on the bottom shelf. Yeah. So if you ja- okay. if you drink Jack Daniels, you'll probably drink some wild turkey. Okay. So wild turkey. They had a massive seven-story warehouse in the hills of rural Kentucky. I don't know Kentucky, but I'm assuming that most of Kentucky is rural. Yeah. But they have this seven-story warehouse just stocked to the gills with freaking wild turkey uh, bourbon. So there was a fire. In the year 2000, at this wild turkey warehouse, a fire, an explosion, and over 17,000 barrels of wild turkey ended up leaking into the nearby river. (laughs) Okay. Now, this the river was also a water supply, but the the had to be (laughs) the whiskey did not get into the water supply. However. Hundreds of thousands of fish across 66 miles of river fucking died. Oh, boy. Over 250,000 fish died over a 66-mile strip of river. And sure, that's bad, but you got to imagine that before they died, those fish had the night of their lives. <laughs> No, I'm saying the fish are just like, Flipper, I love you, man. I love you. We should get an apartment together. (laughs) I'm like so serious. You're like my best friend. We should get an apartment. What fish can't get apartments? 
well, fuck it. We should just do it. We should just do it. Let's just go on land. Let's just do it. <laughs> dude, 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 how do we know that we can't breathe air if we've never tried? Let's just go up there and see. Uh-huh. Maybe we can. <laughs> let's, just, let's just try. Or, or in a, a, an opposite way, I'd like to think that right before they all died, the fish had like one of those high school about to graduate movies. Yeah. You know, where it's like, oh man, let's all throw a party. Let's invite that one fish girl who is totally not attractive because she wears her hair up in a ponytail and she has glasses. And then, like, she takes off her glasses and she lets down her ponytail. What? She's beautiful? <laughs> you know? Yeah. They had one of those movies right before they died. So, anyway, thank you, Wild Turkey, I guess, is what I'm saying. <laughs> so, at the end of the year 2000, our hero, let's call him Steve, he gets a job at his local bookstore. Back then... Getting a job at your local bookstore required endless reading. Okay. And I've been, been thinking about this lately because Amber just got her first job. She did. Yeah, and we're all very proud of her. Meanwhile, Emerald's been working for like almost a fucking year. Yeah. And she hates it. And she's complaining like a real person with a job. <laughs> Uh, but Amber, I think today is her third day working, so good for her. But yeah, she she spent maybe like half a shift reading and learning. But back in the day, in the year 2000, when I was hired, there was a big accordion file full of different learning library books that all new employees had to read. So it's like, okay, now read this book on helping customers. Now this will take you four hours. When yeah. you're done with it, you can start reading this book on working the cash register. This will take you the rest of your shift. So I just spent a week sitting in the break room reading books. So that was fun. Yeah. In fact, the job but was... they sound like boring. boring books. They are. They are. They are. I was trying to be sarcastic. Okay. Just to be clear. Just to be clear. The job was very boring in the beginning. It, originally, I was hired. I keep going from like first person to third person, but it doesn't really matter. Originally, I was hired because the store's receiving manager was going to be moving away in the beginning of 2001. So I was hired originally to be the receiving manager, uh -huh. which is odd because I ended up not being the receiving manager, but I am the receiving manager now, 16 years later. Yes. So that's a bit weird for me. It's a circle um, of life. Yeah. So after the first week of my read training, I was told that the receiving manager is not leaving anyway. But my manager said, hey, you were promised 40 hours. You were promised higher than average pay. Uh, you were promised the receiving manager position. You're not getting the receiving manager position, but I will stick to everything else I promised you. So I will promise to give you 40 hours. I will promise to give you this higher than average pay. It, it, I, I'm a man of my word. So you're making this decent amount above minimum wage. And you and I promise you 40 hours later on, much, much later on in California, budget cuts forced our store to cut all 40 hour employees down to 38 hour employees. OK. So I tried to play the Arizona card and say, hey, I was hired with a promise of 40 hours. But apparently when I transferred from Arizona to California, the California store never freaking bothered to get any of my work info from Metro Center. Oh, OK. So basically, I could have been a child molesting Nazi for all they knew. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Because there was no record. They literally had no record of me when I transferred. Anything good I did at at the Arizona store, anything bad I did, it was all, I don't know, expunged. Yes. So and, so and that doesn't was fun. and doesn't that and what would bother me about that is if I had known that that was going to happen, 
I would have spent more time fucking off in that period. Exactly. If I had known, I would have shown up at the California store with like a leather jacket on a motorcycle. Yeah. Hey, what's up? My name is Esteban, but everybody calls me Rip. Threatened customer at knife point? You could have had a lot of fun in that period if you had known that all of those records would just disappear. Yeah, yeah. So my time in Arizona has since been erased, essentially. Are you sure you were there? <clears throat> I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I think that someone may have uh, inceptioned me. Possibly. Yeah. But yeah, I was hired as a receiving manager then. Just kidding. LOL. But back to the boringness. When I was hired, when I was first hired, the company started a brand new thing. Hey, Steve. Um, so we expected you to be a receiving manager and this whole holiday time uh november december january february was going to be spent training you on how to be a receiving manager but since you're not a receiving manager we're not exactly sure what to do with you but we've got something exciting for you see we started this brand new thing just now it's called a membership card okay $25 $25 gets you 10% off everything in store, and they really wanted to push it, especially during the upcoming holiday season. So, my job was, when I was first hired, they set up a folding table literally right in front of our doors. So, once you walked in, you were basically face to face with me. Okay. I was the first you saw. When you came into the store and I greeted everyone. Hi, welcome to. Oh, crap. Can you bleep that? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Hi, welcome to your local bookstore. Would you be interested in purchasing one of our new membership cards? And that was my job. For all of November and all of December, and all of January, and a bit of February. Yeah. And they were so... I just sat at a table and tried to sell membership cards. That's all I did. That sounds exciting. That sounds thrilling. And the first couple of days that I did it, I of course, people thought I was a customer service person. So it's like, would you be interested in purchasing one of our membership cards? No, but I'm looking for this book. Can you help me find it? Yeah, sure. Let's go over to this computer, and I would get in trouble. Yeah. Steve, what are you doing? You stood up. (laughs) You're supposed to sit there. So literally, I would get in trouble for leaving my station. I literally sat there 40 hours a week for three whole months doing nothing but trying to sell membership cards. I couldn't leave to help a customer. I couldn't leave to help people in at the cash register if they were super busy. I couldn't leave to go to the bathroom unless I asked permission. Mm-hmm. I could not leave. So basically, um, I spent a long amount of time pen flipping. Yeah. I became really good at flipping a pen nonchalantly and catching it without looking. Nice. Good at that. I became really good at twirling a pen on my fingers, you know, like a gangster does with a with a silver dollar in a movie. Yeah, I became really good at that. I and and I wrote love letters to my new girlfriend, Debbie. Okay. Hurricane Hurricane Debbie. Hurricane Debbie. Yes, I I am a survivor of Hurricane Debbie. Yes. Debbie and I, we were both theater people and weirdos who uh, went to high schools that were near each other. We lived 20 minutes away from each other, but we never met until we both went to the uh, National Theater High School Theater Conference in Muncie, Indiana. And yeah. it's weird that we live 20 minutes away from each other, but we didn't meet each other until we were in Muncie, Indiana, of all freaking places. So 
we uh, we met there, and there was a little bit of a chemistry between us, a little bit of a romance, but we didn't date. And then we met each other. We finally became friends in Phoenix, and we started dating, but then we stopped dating. And then a year later, we met each other, and then we were going to date, but then we stopped. And then when we were in college, we we met, and we started dating a little bit, but then we stopped. And I really liked her because she was funny and she was a free spirit and she was a tomboy and she she was she was funny. She was a manic pixie dream girl. So we started dating again when we were both 21 years old, but she was not the same person that I knew before. Yeah, she 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 smoked pot all the time. And when she wasn't smoking pot, she was doing a bunch of other drugs. It wasn't just pot. Yeah, she did a bunch of other drugs, too. So she was not <clears throat> the same person who I knew before. I wanted to be dating the person who I met before, uh-huh. but I was lonely and I just needed someone, and she hated me. She absolutely hated me. I was annoying and stupid. Uh, and, and also, to be fair, she had reason to hate me. My family being my family, I didn't know the basics of being an adult. Okay. I didn't know how to wash clothes. I never had to wash dishes. I didn't know what chores were. My parents just in my family, my wife was in my in my in my family in Phoenix. My mom was basically the servant of the entire house and did everything for my father, because if my mom didn't do everything, then my dad would get pissed off. And so we never my brother and I never had chores. We lived we led a really good privileged life away from responsibilities yeah but at the same time my parents gave me life but never showed me how to live yeah and so the people who i ended up with growing up in my 20s and 30s basically had to pay the price i was learning how to be a person okay so that wasn't fun um basically i was lonely and she wanted an imaginary friend that that she wanted a companion, a sidekick, someone by her side. So basically, I was her imaginary friend who she occasionally fucked. Yeah. We were a match made in heaven, but this is a heaven from Supernatural, the TV <laughs> show. So God is gone and missing, and the angels are kind of dicks. And one angel named Castiel definitely wants to have gay sex with a drunken asshole named Dean. Okay. She did drugs all the time, and I drank all the time, and it, basically, these are the things that award-winning off-Broadway plays are made of. <laughs> but also, during this time, I was working only closing shifts during the weekdays, because I told the bookstore, I can't work during the mornings or afternoons, I am a student. Okay. Okay. I was not. I took college seriously for about a year and a half, maybe two years. Every semester after that was basically a blow off. I would sign up for a full load of classes. Mm -hmm. I would buy the books. I would go to class. I would pretend that I was a serious student. But by the middle of the semester, I was maybe going to one or two classes. And I would blow off everything else. My grades, which thank God my parents never saw, would be like, C minus D F F F F. I I I spent about seven years in college, and um, it was bad, and I'm vaguely ashamed of it. I'm vaguely ashamed of my time in college. Now, I want to go back to high school and explain how my grades aren't 100% my fault. Okay. Okay. Um. So, I became a pawn in a fight between two different teachers. I was the editor-in-chief of the school newspaper, um, and I was also a male rights activist, accidentally, because the newspaper had been around at that high school for 13 years, but I was the first male editor-in-chief. Okay. There were they were all women editor in chiefs up until me, so I struck a blow for male rights. Good for you. I'm a hero. At the same time, I was in, I was technically in the speech and debate team, 
All my right. friend Jamie convinced me to do um uh <clears throat> I didn't I thought speech and debate was just I'm going to wear a suit and a tie and I'm going to debate total strangers about serious issues that I don't give a crap about. But there are different uh acting types of speech and debate. There is a a duo in Terp, which is two people acting out a scene, and it can be any scene you want. There's also um, solo uh, dramatic in Terp and solo comedic in Terp. And so my friend Jamie said, let's go into the speech and debate team. We can be in, we can be, we can do duo in Terp. I've got this one scene and it's a serious scene, but we're going to add all this funny stuff to it. And I felt uncomfortable about that, but I went ahead with it because he was excited and whatever. I don't have anything better to do. So we did a duo interpretive scene and we competed at various events and we were never successful. And we, I, I, we ended up like, we went to the state finals and we were like, I think we were ninth yeah. in the state. So we didn't do well. Jamie was upset. He quit the speech and debate team, but the speech and debate teacher on my sophomore year said, Hey, you've got you, you know, you're really good. And I've seen you in some of the school plays and you're talented. Why don't you try and stay in this? Maybe you could do your own solo comedic interpretive scene. And so I, so the next semester the next school year i literally grabbed the first monologue book i found yeah. and found the first monologue i i the first monologue i said okay i'm going with this it it, it in retrospect maybe i should have put some more thought into it it was a monologue called go to church camp learn to kiss okay and it was by peg Corette. And it was a boring ass monologue, but I tried to make it exciting by moving around and I did crazy stuff and my voice was insane. So by the end of the year, I got to fifth place in the state. And that's pretty good. Mm -hmm. Apparently, if you get first, second or third place in the state finals, then you go to nationals. Ooh, which is like Lee. And uh, Nationals is in Washington, D.C. every year. So I, I, so my senior year, I said, I'm going to try and be successful in this. And yeah. also my senior year, I was the editor-in-chief of the school newspaper. So I tried really hard with speech and debate. And I got, <clears throat> I wanted to do something different, something that nobody else had seen before. A lot of the people who are really successful were doing things that other people had done and that that you've seen before over and over again. Oh, I'm going to do this scene from Greater Tuna. Oh, I'm going to do this scene. So I wanted something different. So I got the Matt Groening comic strip, Life in Hell. Uh-huh. And he had like 25 part series, School is Hell. And I literally got every bit of dialogue that was written in that comic strip. And I turned it into a big giant play. And I edit it into a tight 10 minute piece and i i turned a comic strip into a uh into a monologue and it, i was the first person to ever do this yeah. and people were really upset and i was always getting challenged by people in the beginning and i always had the the book that i bought at my local bookstore here's the book right here i bought it all of the words are in here here's my script and here's the book feel free so it got to the point that i would just be carrying the book around with me from every to every contest that i had i would go from this classroom to this classroom i had yeah. love it. i had school as hell in my hands and it got to the point where my so well they in- challenged you like how like it wasn't a legitimate monologue or no, like you're making that up. And what if you're, you were? Uh, then you could be disqualified. Jamie and I... So creativity could, is discouraged? Yeah, no, it has to be a published work. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, so it got to the point where I developed a name for myself and people were looking for the school as hell guy and people would lose in the opening rounds and then they would literally just follow me to all of my it's like oh i just i just lost but where's the school as hell guy gonna be at next where is it gonna be in this room okay i'm going there 
So I, I got a name for myself. I worked my butt off and all of the rest of my high school debate team completely lost. But I got third place in the state. Nice. For for a uh, solo humorous interp, which meant I qualified to go to the national competition in Washington, D.C., in our nation's capital, which happened to be the exact same day that the high school journalism conference was happening in San Francisco. Mm. And I really wanted to go to the speech and debate uh to the finals yeah. to the national contest but my journalism teacher wouldn't let me she kept saying you can't go to speech because speech is what you want to do going to the journalism conference with your staff is what you should do ooh so the speech and debate teacher said, Steve, it's probably just a misunderstanding. I'll go to your journalism teacher and talk to her and tell her how much this means to you and how this could lead to important things. They're even going to like, like televise it on C-SPAN. This is a big deal for you yeah. and you should do it. And so don't worry, I'll talk to the teacher. And then the, the, the speech and debate teacher comes back 20 minutes later, like in tears. <laughs> she is a horrible person and she won't let you go. And I tried, Steve. I tried. Oh, so, man. So it was a horrible position to be in. Literally, I would be in class, like in science, and the science teacher would be, Steve, can you come up to my desk? And I'm like, okay, crap, what did I do? And I go, yes, you wanted to see me, teacher? Yes. What are you thinking of doing? You're going to go with the journalism or are you going to go with the speech and debate? Personally, I think you should go with journalism. That's the responsible thing, Steve. But I just wanted to know what you were thinking. What are you going to do, Steve? What are you going to do? And who was this questioning you? Uh, the science teacher. The science teacher. Yeah, yeah, just people that had, it, it became something that everybody was talking about. All right. And all the teachers were like, oh, Steve, Steve. What are you going to do, huh? What are you leaning towards, huh? Huh? <laughs> if I were you, I'd pick this, but what are, what are you going to do? So it became this, like, horrible thing that I was... Do just, you suspect that there was wagering? I don't know. There might have been. Yeah. But eventually, what I chose was, I chose to go with journalism. I wanted to do the uh, speech and debate, but I thought that by picking journalism... I was picking the responsible adult thing. Yes. But what I was really doing was, if I pick the responsible adult thing, people will respect me. I wasn't doing it for the right things. I was right. doing it because, oh, people will be like, Steve, you gave up this big important thing to do this. How adult of you. Mm -hmm. We should have sex. That's really what I was. <laughs> that's really why I chose that. Yeah, I was a pawn. Like I could have gone to my parents and asked for help, but uh, it, I didn't have the best family life. I knew not to ask my parents for help about anything personal. Right. My parents didn't care. My parents just didn't care. So, um, when I went to college, what I wanted to do was theater, but for some reason, I I had such a horrible time with with fighting against speech and debate and journalism that I said I want to do theater. But when I was in high school, journalism won. So I guess I'm learning to be a reporter in college. Okay. So I it. it my seven years in college were horrible because I was trying to get a degree in something that I fucking hated. Yeah. And that I didn't like, I'm not a, I'm not a, I'm not a CNN reporter. I'm like someone who does smart ass reviews in the entertainment section. Mm hmm. So yeah, my seven years in college is a source of shame for me. Plus the student loans. God damn it. The student loans. I was like, it, I was talking to my dad and I'm like, well, I have to pay 
this back? How am I supposed to pay this back? I don't want to like take this money if I have to pay it back over like 10 or 20 years. That's what uh, TV keeps telling me and movies tell me is going to happen. What am I going to do? I don't understand student loans, dad. And my dad said, Stevie, don't worry about it. I'm going to put the loans under my name so you won't have to pay these back. Okay, don't worry about the student loans. I'll handle it. I will take care of the student loans. Don't worry about it, Steve. That was all a lie. I paid it off like five years ago. Okay. My dad was totally lying about all that. I'm going to handle the student loans. I was 100% saddled for the seven years that I was in college. My dad never paid, sent one of my student loans. He never put the loans under his name. He was totally lying to me. And there was a period in time when my paychecks at the bookstore were garnished. Oh, okay. Where I had like emerald and Isabella, and we were thinking of having another one, but my paychecks were getting cut in like a third. Yeah. Because of the goddamn student loans that I was still struggling to pay in my 30s. So, uh, screw you, dad, I guess is what I'm saying. Yes. But if I ignore the shame and the crippling debt that it left me in, College was fun as hell. Okay. I did a lot of drinking. I was pretending to go to school during the day, working at night, drinking like a fish. And my job was to sit at a table. Yeah. You know, it was a really weird, fun time. I became a master when I was in college of just gaming the system. Yeah. My dad would give me like $100 a week for being in college so I can buy food and maybe some, you know, maybe go to maybe one movie, Steve, but that's it. Yeah. You're there for school. You're there to learn. So I would go to, cl- I would, I would arrive at school at like 9 AM, maybe go to one class. Uh, I, I, I knew all the places, all of the, the departments at college that gave out free coffee. Yeah. And donuts. So there was my breakfast. Mm-hmm. Uh, I when I first went to college, I was a staple of their like a uh, film and uh, their film department. Yeah, and eventually they got like new students who were in charge of the film department. But I still knew where the department was that they left the door open at all times and where they kept all of their free stuff and their food. <laughs> So, like, it, it's lunchtime, and I'm like, okay, I know how to go into the uh, campus corner and get a free large soda because, okay, down here they have free cups for water, but they're free soda sized cups for water. So, I'll get this free cup of soda, then go upstairs to the Taco Bell where they have a line that curves. So, I can go right over here and get a soda and then just walk away. So, there's my free soda. Yeah. I'm going to go into the film department. They're empty at this point period in time during the day so here's two pieces of pizza a hot dog i've got my free soda and look a free t-shirt for eight for showtime's the l word (laughs) and two movie passes for this weekend so i know what i'm doing this weekend Mm -hmm. and then i would use the hundred or hundred and fifty dollars my dad gave me to basically just go to movies all day cool I became a master of of just I would go into the movies. It's a college town, so I had a backpack, but my backpack was filled with like two t shirts and a hat. So I and the the daily newspaper, so I could spend the entire day in the movie theater. Nice. I would watch double and triple features. That was my college. <laughs> so as long as I ignore the shame and crippling debt, college was just a fucking blast. Yeah. But my job was for November, December, January, and a bit of February sitting at a table. It is a miracle that uh, our hero didn't just quit. But our hero did not. And finally, middle of February 2001, I was finally being trained to be a bookseller. I was trained primarily by two people, a laid-back 30-something hippie and a stereotypical man-hating lesbian. Okay. Both of their existences and my existences in the same store was, I believe, proof positive that our flamboyantly, openly gay DGAF store manager hired different kinds of people. Just to to interject a little here, uh, in in my college years, 
uh, I would run across fairly frequently. You know, you just travel in circles that are close to other people's circles. Yeah. You know? Yeah. But there was this real man-hating dyke that I would run into fairly often and really didn't care about. The only, the one thing that struck me is that she was, she would wear a pin that I had seen at the bus stop one time that said, don't assume I'm straight. And I was like, that never even occurred to me. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. So trust me, I did not make that assumption at all. Yeah. So my two trainers, that could be a sitcom. The hippie is just what she was called. She wasn't really a hippie. She was just from California. Yeah. She was, in fact, she was from Northern California. In fact, she spent her time, she spent a good a couple of years uh, at a, in the beginning of her book selling career working at a store in Sacramento, California by Arden Mall. Info I quickly forgot because mm-hmm. why would I need to know? that you worked at the store by Arden Mall in Sacramento, California. I will never (laughs) need to know that information. Yes. That has already been forgotten. (laughs) Boom. Now, the second trainer, she was a regular bookseller. She had been an employee there for about two years, two and a half years. The first day she trained me, she literally started out, first off, right off the bat, True story, honest to God, hand on my heart. Honestly, she started off by saying this. Okay, before I train you, one thing you should know about me, I hate all men. (laughs) Boys are stupid and I hate them. Okay. Now, of course, this turned me on. I'm just kidding. Like, what am I supposed to say about that? I'm just kidding about the turning me on part, but not about what she said. That is literally what she said. Yeah. The first time I meet this woman, the first time she's training me, that's how she starts off training Mm -hmm. me. Yeah. What the hell am I supposed to say to that? This is going to be a very successful uh, training section. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So I said, I agree. Okay. And that shut her the hell up because apparently I was the first person to ever agree with her. (laughs) She was like, what? And I said, yeah, I agree. Men suck. And there was a silence, like a stone cold silence. And then she assessed as she assessed me, you know, looking me up and down. And finally she said, okay, I like you. We're friends now. (laughs) So boom. I just got my first work friend. Yep. And that, my vague friends, my unconventional conventionists, is where we will leave this story for this week. We are now in the year 2001, and I don't think anything big or memorable happened in America in 2001. So. No. Yeah. Yeah, that should be fun. Bush was president and everything was just kind of nothing memorable. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Can't think of anything. Can't think of anything. Now, a bit of news before we end this week's notes from the bookstore, and this is some true news. You, you are, are, are you going to be mentioning Milo in this section? I absolutely am. Milo, okay. Milo Yiannopoulos, alt-right dick face and believer of dumbass ideas that are all wrong. Yeah. He somehow managed to score a big time big figure book deal with a major book publisher but then there mm-hmm. was a ton of pushback on account of uh uh Milo Yiannopoulos makes a living out of saying the absolute worst freaking things yes he once called a reporter a shit media jew once mm mm-hmm. He outed a trans student at a lecture at a college once. Yeah. 
he called feminism and uh, Islam a cancer on society. Yeah. Feminism. And he once claimed in a really crappy bit of clickbait that Donald Trump is the nation's first black president. <laughs> The first real black president. He's a hate-mongering dick cheese. So his publisher, Simon & Schuster, canceled his big book deal. And that should be a win. Uh Uh-huh. But no, what he did is he got his book that was already ready to be published by Simon & Schuster, and he self-published his book. Right. And self-publishing is the bane of your local bookstore. Because basically... You go to a self-publishing book publisher, you pay them to publish your book. And what happens now is, technically, the book doesn't exist. It does not exist until you pay for it. Then it is printed out by this fly-by-night company and sent directly to your house. Mm -hmm. So, basically, anybody can now publish a book. Yeah. Anyone. There's a lot of 60 and 70 year olds telling their lame ass story. And now Milo Yiannopoulos Mm -hmm. is telling his story. But this, this ass waffle is great at pissing people off and then playing the victim. Yeah. So he spews his hate and gets people pissed off and gets people riled up and gets people as angry as he can so that when people cancel his events, he turns and goes, how dare you violate my free speech? Yeah. But this isn't a First Amendment issue. You're just a jackass, you know? Yeah. And, and And that's what really annoys me about the whole free speech thing is that how many people do not understand what free speech is? You know? I cannot violate Milo's First Amendment, right? I cannot do that. You cannot do that. The, only the government can do that. Yeah. You have free speech in that the government will not interfere in what you say and will not try to stop or censure you. Yeah, that doesn't mean you get to say any belief you have or whenever and wherever you want. Well, it means yeah. that that oh, never mind. I lost it. What? Yeah, so Milo. nobody nobody violates Milo's right by protesting. Nobody yeah. violates yeah. Ann Coulter's right by protesting. You have stupid shit to say. We don't want you to say it. That's our First Amendment right now. You don't get to have more First Amendment rights because you have shitty things to say. Or because you're rich and famous. If we keep in mind what the First Amendment is actually pretending, pretending, pretending to, and, and what freedom of speech is, a lot of this shit would just go away. You know? Yeah. So, like this, you know, because certain things will just, society will look at certain things and just go, well, that was stupid. You know? Protesting Ann Coulter, really, kind of a fucking waste of time, isn't it? That was kind of stupid. You know? Yeah. They still had their right to do it. Yeah. You know? And I had just heard a radio station, a publicly funded radio station, in um, Berkeley had canceled an interview with Richard Dawkins because they feel that he is um, Islamophobic. Yes. Okay. And it's like the government didn't do it. I mean, I got some questions about a public station and what that really means. I mean, yeah. if it's funded by government money, he should, they shouldn't have. But other than that, do it. And the rest of us will just chalk it up to some stupid fucking thing a radio station did. Yeah. You know? Yeah. It's you want to do it, go ahead and do it. And you'll, yeah. you'll get whatever backlash you get from it. Yeah. 
So what Milo Yiannopoulos did is he self-published his book. We do not carry self-published books because any uh, jackhole can self-publish a book. When you self-publish a book, that means that it's not returnable, yeah. which means this was printed out specifically for you. And if you decide not to buy it, this isn't something that we can return for our to the publisher and get money back. Right. We lose money with a self-published book. So if you want a self-published book, if you want Milo Yiannopoulos' book, come on in. Pay for it. We'll have it sent directly to your house. This isn't something right now that we can carry in the store. Yeah. However, our company has said that because of the popularity of this book, we are trying to work with the publisher to eat, to get books available for the stores. So we mm -hmm. are working on carrying this book because it's a popular book and we just carry popular books. But he self-published it. And now he's saying... How dare not carry my book? Yeah. But it's not. But and, and other signed, book carriers. Yeah. 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 It, it, yes. Yes. How, how dare bookstores not carry my book? But it's not that bookstores aren't carrying it. It's just that you're self-publishing this book. Anybody can self-publish a book. You're, you're making yourself the victim when it's your fault. Yeah. You're the one who lost the book deal. Mm -hmm. You're the one who is now being forced to self-publish your book through through your own freaking website. And now you're like, how dare Target not carry my book? You you can only get it through your website. Mm -hmm. It's ridiculous. Yeah. Yeah, um, Milo Yiannopoulos is the bane of my existence right now. So right now we literally have right-wing alt-right people calling us and yelling at us because we're not carrying his book. Mm -hmm. This is now happening all the time. I, I, I had seen it pop up on Facebook here and there. I, I did not realize that they were calling you as well. Yeah, and they're coming in and they're saying, how come you don't carry this book? How come you don't? How come you don't have this? Yeah. Why do you refuse to carry this book? It's not that we refuse to carry this book. It's just we can't right now because right now it is a non-returnable book that's only being published by this one guy. Yeah. It's only being released by him. He controls the means of production. Mm hmm It's like if I started making T-shirts. Right. And only I am making the T-shirts. But then I get people riled up by saying, how dare Walmart refuse to carry my T-shirts? Yeah. And people go to Walmart yelling at Walmart, how dare you not carry Steve's T-shirts? Well, let's say it, that's Steve's fault. That's not ours. He's the one doing this. He's the one making the shirt. That's basically my life right now, and it's not fun. Mm-hmm. Basically, a bunch of people who already hated us have found a reason to hate us. Yes. And people who have never come into the bookstore are now saying, I just want you to know that I am never coming into your bookstore again. I'm like, and, oh, yeah. and, and we really need for people to have more reasons to dislike books. Yeah. It's like, oh, really? I thought you were such a huge reader. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, good job uh, protecting uh, Milo Yiannopoulos, because Lord <laughs> knows he's crying right now mm -hmm. in his tower in, up in a castle, crying because a one bookstore won't carry his books. Good job yeah. defending him. <laughs> yeah. He's worth fighting over. The biggest thing that pisses me off, well, beyond his existence, the biggest yeah. thing that pisses me off about Milo or whatever, which version would he hate the most? I bet you he hates being called Milo. I'm going to call him Milo. Probably. Uh, the, you know, in his own head, he fancies himself a modern day Oscar Wilde. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. He probably thinks that he is witty 
and yeah. and hip and bold and yeah. daring and scandalous. And it's no, you're a douchebag. Yeah. Yeah. He probably thinks that just the sun shines out of his backside. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, so, yeah. even the title of his book, Dangerous, it's like, Milo, you are not dangerous. Yeah. You're you're ju- you're you're just a loud mouth. Yeah, you're you're an annoyance. You know, and we always had people like Milo. Obviously, Milo's a bit of an extreme, but just some of these people, Kim Kardashian might as well be Milo. These people that are almost like celebrity ticks on the body of yeah. society. Yeah. You know. And yeah. they're just not worth anything. They're talked about for a little while. And then they fall off and die. Yeah. I can't think of any other good examples, because that's how non-memorable they are. Yeah. It's, yeah, it's sad. It's sad. But anyway... That is it for Note from the Bookstore this week. And remember, you too can save 10% on all of your purchases. And all you have to do is find a professional YouTuber that does not yell all the time. (laughs) That's all you have to do is find a professional YouTuber that does not constantly yell all the time. If you find that person, then... Do me a favor and ask them how Google Plus works. Yes. Because I, I would really be interested in seeing how they deal with malicious content. 